This is off the uh, diocesan oh. website, but um, it should be letting me record. And... Oh, this is great. This is the Zoom the live stream. No, that one. Shall we move? Oh, it's in the. You know, do you want to see it? It's my favorite person. <laughs> Thank you. That's perfect. Thank you.
I can't see that. Hmm? I can't see that. Can't see what? That's what I'm looking for. Are you going to bring your chair over? Welcome to Mass, everyone. This feast of uh, St. Lucy, martyr of the church. Gabby's going to lead us in praise in our first hymn, 300, Glory and Praise, and stand prepared to worship. <laughs> especially as we get ready for the Christmas season. We prepare ourselves to celebrate these sacred mysteries, calling to mind her need for God's grace and asking his forgiveness of our sins and healing in our lives. I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned in my thoughts and in my words, in what I have done and in what I have failed to do. Through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Therefore, I ask, Blessed Mary, ever Virgin, all the angels and saints, and to you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God. May the Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, 
and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. reading from the book of Numbers. Balaam looked up and saw Israel camping tribe by tribe. Then the Spirit of God came upon him, and he uttered his oracle, saying, The oracle of Balaam, son of Baal, the oracle of the man whose eye is clear, the oracle of one who hears the words of God, who sees the vision of the Almighty, who falls down, but with eyes uncovered. How fair are your tents, O Jacob, your encampments, O Israel. Like palm groves that stretch far away, like gardens beside a river, like aloes that the Lord has planted, like cedar trees beside the waters. Water shall flow from his buckets, and his seed shall have abundant water. His king shall be higher than Acre, and his kingdom shall be exalted. Again, Balaam utters his oracle, saying, The oracle of Balaam, son of Baal, the oracle of the man whose eye is clear, the oracle of one who hears the word of the Lord, and knows the knowledge of the Most High, who sees the vision of the Almighty, who falls down, but with his eyes uncovered. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. The star shall come out of Jacob, and the scepter shall rise out of Israel. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Teach me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your ways, O Lord. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. Teach, teach me, me your ways, ways, O Lord. Lead me in your... Sorry. Be mindful of your mercy, O Lord, and of your steadfast love. For they have been from old. According to your steadfast love, remember me. For your goodness sake, O Lord. Teach, Teach me in your ways, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble to what is right and teaches the humble his ways. Teach, Teach me in your ways, O Lord.
according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord. When Jesus entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him as he was teaching and said, By what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? Jesus said to them, I will also ask you one question. If you tell me the answer, then I will also tell you by what authority I do these things. Did the baptism of John come from heaven or was it of human origin? They argued with one another. If we say from heaven, he will say to us, well, why then did you not believe him? But if we say of human origin, we are afraid of the crowd for all regard John as a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we do not know. And he said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. My words are very brief now because a presentation will follow at the uh, at the end of Mass. You know, it's one thing to pray or proclaim something like what we've just said in the responsorial psalm. Teach me your ways, O Lord. We want to be taught. We want to be shown by God his will for our lives. And yet God has been showing us and teaching us for a long time, um, since the beginning of time. And it's fascinating how all of us, you know, we go back in history, uh, people with great expectation, with lots of information, with lots of experience of God. And you know what? They still miss significant pieces of the gospel of salvation, including in our gospel, scribes and Pharisees. Um, they're merely limited to not wanting to get caught as they want to catch Jesus. And yet his proclamation is for this world and is beyond, out of this world. I would put to you that our three days together are hopefully, you know, and I, I pray for God's blessing and grace for this, will be an experience where we're called to relate to this life and this situation, but also go beyond it. Not beyond it in the sense that it takes us away from this place, but it sees this place here in Sioux, um, as God's plan for your lives to make manifest in a, in a deeper way uh, the life, mission, and ministry of Christ. Not that you're not doing that. Of course you are. Uh, there's that. In my few days here, I've seen many blessings and signs of that. But we're always called to go deeper. We can't help but go deeper. Uh, our, our human lives are edified uh, by going deeper. And I, I would dare say that this mission, which is reflecting on your pastoral plan as a parish at this time and place, and the synod on synodality that's happening in the church throughout the world, is an occasion not merely for change, but for growth and conversion. And so as we enter into this mission, which is entitled um, Communion, Participation, and Mission, let us truly be open to when we say, teach me your ways, O Lord, we're ready for where that might lead us. We bring before God our prayers and petitions. We first of all pray for our church, Pope Francis, my brother priests and bishops, all the lay faithful, either discerning their vocation or living their vocation since the time of their yes, that we will always daily be open to receiving fully and trustingly the inspiration and the guidance of the Holy Spirit, a call to deepening and to greater holiness of life, we pray to the Lord. Lord. At this time, in which we know there's many difficulties around us, we 
Pray for the needy, for the sick, those in difficulty, those in crisis, for those who have asked us for our prayers. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. I ask the Lord's blessing with you on these days together, that this time of mission, this time of Advent retreat, be truly a time of grace and blessing and renewal. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Other prayers. Pray for my candidates uh, for baptism, confirmation, first holy communion in RCIA. We bless them during this time of conversion, with grace, with charity, with a great sense of the communion of the Holy Catholic Church. For this, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Almighty God, source of all blessings, hear all our prayers spoken and known by you in the depths of our hearts. And we make all these prayers with Mary, our mother, in Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness, we have received the bread we offer. Fruit of the earth, work of human hands, it will become for us the bread of life. Yes. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness, we have received the wine we offer. Fruit of the vine work of human hands, it will become for us our spiritual drink. Pray, brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. Amen, the Lord, the sacrifice of your hands. May the offerings we bring in celebration of Blessed Lucy win your gracious acceptance, O Lord, we pray, just as the struggle of her suffering and passion was pleasing to you through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God. For in the saints who consecrated themselves to Christ for the sake of the kingdom of heaven, it is right to celebrate the wonders of your providence by which you call human nature back to its original holiness and bring it to experience on this earth the gifts you promise in the new world to come. And so with all the angels and saints, we praise you as without end we acclaim.
You are indeed holy, O Lord, the fount of all holiness. Make holy, therefore, the gifts we pray by sending down your spirit upon them like the dew fall, so that they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. At the time he was betrayed and entered willingly into his passion, he took bread and giving thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take this all of you and eat of it. For this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice and once more giving thanks, gave it to his disciples saying, take this all of you and drink from it. For this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. of salvation, giving thanks that you have held us worthy to be in your presence and minister to you. Humbly, we pray that partaking of the body and blood of Christ, we may be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. Remember, Lord, your church spread throughout the world and bring her to the fullness of charity, together with Francis, our Pope, and Gary, our Bishop, and all the clergy. Remember also our brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep in the hope of the resurrection and all who have died in your mercy. Welcome them into the light of your face. Have mercy on us all, we pray, that with the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with Blessed Joseph, her spouse, with the Blessed Apostles, with Saint Rose of Lima, and all the saints who pleased you throughout the ages, we may merit to be co-heirs to eternal life and may praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him, with him, in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. command and formed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory of yours, now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, 
who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. May the peace of the Lord be with you always.
Let us conclude our prayer. Let us pray. O God, who bestowed on blessed Lucy a crown among the saints, for her twofold triumph of virginity and martyrdom, grant, we pray, through the power of this sacrament, that bravely overcoming every evil, we may obtain the glory of heaven. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And, and may the blessing of God Almighty be with you always, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We go in the peace and light of Christ.
Saskatoon. If you didn't meet him at Mass on the weekend, maybe you'll include a little bit of a self-introduction. That'd be good. Uh, and you'll hear all about uh, the theme, which he, uh, he really uh, gave us a little highlight of during the homily uh, for these next three days. And just so I don't forget, uh, we're following tonight with tomorrow morning, first thing, 9 o'clock, back here for Mass. Uh, same format following the, uh, the Mass will be another one of his substantial presentations. Uh, and following that, and maybe even during that, uh, we'll have a, a couple of extra priests here uh, for the opportunity during his Advent penitential season for, for confession. Uh, that will be back in the library, my office, um, and also the multi-purpose room. Uh, so we'll try and figure out how best to uh, administrate that, but that will be an opportunity uh, during and, uh, and after the presentation tomorrow. So that's our plan. And the last day will be Wednesday morning, same thing, 9 o'clock, substantial presentation afterwards, and that will conclude the mission. Thank you, Bishop Mark. Okay. Carry on. Well, thank you. Um, well, I guess for those maybe who missed uh, um, a little bit of introduction about myself, um, my name is Mark Hageman. I, I originally grew up in this area, well, in, in the Vancouver, North Vancouver, North Shore area. And I was ordained a priest in 1990 for the Archdiocese of Vancouver. Um, I, I grew up loving the mountains. And to this day, I spend a lot of time, not so much in the mountains in Saskatchewan, but certainly outdoors and uh, spent a fair bit of time Later in August, actually, there's been group of groups of Saskatchewan men who have wanted to come out since they know I love the mountains and uh, join me in the mountains to experience them. So I had two groups of guys this summer come out when I was visiting my dad and my brother who live in the Coquitlam area now uh, in latter August. Um, <clears throat> had different assignments in Vancouver. A big one was youth ministry. I was involved in that for over a decade youth and young adult ministry. And then I, I, I hungered and thirst to be a pastor. I had been delayed in that because of all my work with youth. And then following that and working with the diocese, um, my last years were working as principal of two Catholic colleges at the University of British Columbia, St. Mark's and Corpus Christi colleges. And from there, it was while I was trying to recruit students to go to the college in of all places, Sri Lanka, um, I was summoned to be the Bishop of Mackenzie. I have to tell you this. I don't do heat well. I, I hate heat. I'll take the cold to the heat any day. So I was recruiting students in Sri Lanka. Well, it's on the equator and it was hot and I couldn't find an air conditioner. And so after the first week of visiting eight high schools, I was just done. And so I stuck my head in front of a fan and I said, God, deliver me from this heat. I can't do another week. I opened my emails, and there was an email from the papal nuncio. Call me anytime with urgency. Oh, that's weird. So I said, well, it's 3 a.m. in Ottawa. I'm not going to call him now. I'll call him at 6. So I called a few hours later and basically said, ah, yes, the Holy Father, Pope Francis, Pope Francis had just been installed would like you to be the Bishop of Mackenzie. Do you accept? And so Mackenzie, Mackenzie Fort Smith? Uh, yes. Uh, okay. Okay, what is okay? You accept? I said, oh no, it's a figure of speech, Your Excellency. So I asked him a few questions and I asked him for some time to pray. Anyway, the moral of the story is be careful what you ask for. <laughs> you might get it. You know, I went from Sri Lanka to the coldest place on the planet for kind of love. Um, I was ordained actually eight years ago yesterday. And I still remember how the bishops coming up because it, well, it was mid-December, December 15th. And um, it was cold. It was minus 42, wind chill minus 59. So I remember the bishops, the bishops came on a part of a, a flight. And I don't know if any of you know Bishop Fred Henry. He's retired now. He's a very vocal bishop. He says what he thinks. So he gets off the plane, the wind blows, and he goes, oh, thank God I'm not the bishop of this God-forsaken place. <laughs> One of the other bishops said, tell us what you really think, Bishop Fred. Anyway, so I was thinking of that yesterday. <laughs> a few other, my brother just, this is God-awful. I have one brother 
He's in, uh, he's taking care of my dad. My mom died five years ago. My father's on dialysis. He's had some health problems, but he's stubborn and very independent. I can't believe he's my dad. Anyway, and uh, he lives in Port Moody. So I, I saw them on my way through. I spent a day with dad and celebrated her birthday with the family. Anyway, a little bit about me. I was four years in the North. I love the North, I have to tell you, I really did. It's very challenging, but it's very, you'll never forget it. It leaves an impression on you. And then I've been in Saskatoon now four years and both places have been a blessing. Saskatoon's a real blessing. And so I come to you with kind of those experiences as I respond to your pastor's request to do a kind of mission. Originally it was on pastoral planning. And then the synod by Pope Francis was announced. And, um, and so I said to Father Dean, I said, we have to talk about the synod. And then as I reflected on it, I thought there is no better time for your parish and the parish in Langford to reflect on a, a kind of a pastoral plan than when we're doing the synod. And so I hope over the next three days to develop, you know, and to give you a few insights about this, because the synod actually demands a process that I, I put to you, your parish um, will be undertaking as you answer some questions, as you reflect on what uh, the synod on synodality is asking of all of us. And as it inspires you, not just about what to do, but how to do it. Very important phrase, not just what to do, but how to do it. So let's move into the introduction here. So what does synodality mean? And some of you know who were maybe at Mass yesterday, you know, synodality, I, I did made some effort to, to kind of define, but I'd like to pull it apart a little bit. I mean, one of the related phrases is co-responsibility, but we're gonna talk about several related phrases. But first the prayer, there's a prayer for the synod. And I don't know if you can see it, but I thought we would pray it for those who can see it, pray it with me as you read it. And let us pray in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. We stand before you, Holy Spirit, as we gather together in your name, with you alone to guide us. Make yourself at home in our hearts. Teach us the way we must go and how we are to pursue it. We are weak and sinful. Do not let us promote disorder. Do not let ignorance lead us down the wrong path, nor partiality influence our actions. Let us find in you our unity so that we may journey together to eternal life and not stray from the way of truth and what is right. All this we ask of you who are at work in every place and time in the communion of the Father and the Son forever and ever. Amen in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. You know, of all the synods, and we've had a few under Pope Francis, this could be the one that is most close to his heart. Um, synodality has many meanings, and as we pull those apart, I think we will reflect on the papacy of Pope Francis. But let us remember that this papacy is not in isolation. And then in fact, I mean, I've lived most of my life in the church, you know, under the papacy of Pope John Paul II, long time, and then Pope Benedict XVI, and now Pope Francis. And uh, it's fascinating to me how they have all developed one key theme for the church. That's the theme of the new evangelization. You've probably heard that phrase a lot over the last 30 years. And yet, as each of them has focused on this theme, they have focused on it uniquely given their own time and place and their own uh, pastoral experience. Um, but they have also developed it uh, as we've seen time pass. So as I mentioned yesterday in the homily, synodality comes from two Greek words, way or journey or pathway and with. And the theme of uh, the synod is for a synodal, syn synodal church, communion, participation, and mission. And so I, just a heads up, today I'm going to focus on the first of those three, communion. Communion, participation, and mission. 
in many ways they're developmental, but they're not merely developmental. They're kind of, you know, it's good to put them sort of in a, a circle because one relates to the other relates to the other. And so they're, they're not sort of one doesn't come first, then the next, then the next. I, I would say mission inspires communion. Communion calls for participation. And participation in communion sends us forth in mission. So they, they're, they're related. Um, there's two key documents. And oops, these are available to you online. If you go to most diocesan websites, including ours in Saskatoon, I know Vancouver has it. I'm going to guess Victoria. If they don't have it, they will soon. Has these two documents. The first document on the right is the preparatory document. And it's the document that gives the background and sets up the synod. The vata mecum is really how to do the synod. And, and it's probably the handbook on the synod. And it's the handbook that many parishes are now looking over to kind of figure out how to do this. And what I'd like to do is briefly quote a few statements from the Vatican, the document on the left, to give you some insight about the process and what, what, it, what we're doing. So from the Vatican, Synod is an ancient and venerable word in the tradition of the church, whose meaning draws from the deepest themes of divine revelation. It indicates the path along which the people of God walk together. Equally, it refers to the Lord Jesus, who presents himself as the way, the truth, and the life, and to the fact that Christians, his followers, were originally called the followers of the way. Remember, Christians are people who distinguish, distinguish themselves as living in the world, but not being of the world. I mean, they had a vision that took them from the place that they were at. And this was a blessed place. It wasn't a place to run from. It wasn't a place to think that God didn't put us here. He, he puts us here. But it's a place from which we shine and bloom in the Christian life as we have a trajectory that is not just 70 or 80 or 90 or 100 years. It is eternity. So even if you make it to 110, that's nothing for the Christian compared to eternal life. And that's something so difficult to come to terms with, especially in a culture that is so able to predict, to control, uh, to uh, kind of eliminate so many things that, that uh, cause human uh, suffering and difficulty. And then when we get to the point we can't control that, what's the use? That's it, I'm done. <laughs> it's not the Christian way. You know, life is a mystery. It's an adventure. And we rest in the author of creation to show us the way, the truth and the life to eternal life and abundant life. Second part, first and foremost, synodality denotes the particular style that qualifies the life and mission of the church, expressing her nature as the people of God journeying together and gathering in assembly, summoned by the Lord Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit to proclaim the gospel. Synodality ought to be expressed in the church's ordinary, not extraordinary or super, there too, but in the ordinary way of living and working together. The ordinary way. I want to sort of um, highlight also the issue of gathering in assembly. I mean, what is the people who look on Catholics? What is one of the best things that Catholics do to non-Catholics? Well, we gather intentionally every Sunday to celebrate Eucharist together. And um, how we gather and worship denotes or has an impact on how we live life. You know, the whole story of the Old Testament, right worship, right praise, right honoring of God, um, helps form and shape us so that we can do the same in the world with one another. So a little bit of an insight on the importance of being a people of God, gathering in worship for the sake of going out in the world. Uh, in other words, mission. A couple other quotes from the Vatican. In this sense, synodality enables the entire people of God to walk forward together, listening 
to the Holy Spirit and the word of God, listening to participate in the mission of the church in communion that Christ establishes between us. Ultimately, this path of walking together is the most effective way of manifesting and putting into practice the nature of the church as the pilgrim and missionary people of God. Hear that emphasis, you know, the way in which we put into practice being the church and participating in this mission to bring blessing and peace and health and light to the world is how we walk together. No one of us can do this in and of himself. Of course, there's a time for us to, to kind of allow the, the place of God to rest in our own hearts and souls. Uh, you know, there, there's a time for us to be alone with God, but we must walk together to uh, fully live in the life, mission, and ministry of Christ. The entire people of God shares a common dignity and vocation through baptism. All of us are called in virtue of our baptism to be active participants in the life of the church. In parishes, small Christian communities, lay movements, religious communities, other forms of communion, women and men, young and old, we are all invited to listen to one another in order to hear the promptings of the Holy Spirit who comes to guide our human efforts, breathing life and vitality into the church and leading us into deeper communion for the mission in the world. As the church embarks on this synodal journey, we must strive to ground ourselves in experience of authentic listening and discernment on the path of becoming the church God calls us to be. So that last sentence lays out what Pope Francis is calling us to. If we're going to, if we're going to do this well, we need to occasionally ground ourselves in real listening and discernment. He's calling us to that experience now. So again, what is synodality? So I mentioned again uh, yesterday in the homily, comes from two Greek words, with or way or pathway. Um, focuses on the living journey of the disciples. So synodality is really not about a plan. It's not about a program. It's about a way and how we imitate Christ, how we live in the world expresses that disciples accompany each other on the journey to the kingdom. And we've heard that word accompany or accompaniment a lot from Pope Francis over the last while. And it's not merely a Pope Francis term, of course. Accompaniment is at the heart of discipleship. You know, um, when I was a young, younger man, you know, I, I needed lots of spiritual direction to discern the priesthood. And I continue to need it to live being a priest and now a bishop. People need accompaniment in many ways. Parents accompany children. Um, as children grow up and become teenagers, they need to be accompanied by older adults. And when they become older adults, they are helped and they are formed by how they accompany others. Um, in our parishes and our communities, there's many ways in which people are called to accompany and walk together. One of the things I learned in the North, I have to tell you, it was touched on last night. I don't know if you remember, Father Dean, about fences. Um, most of the Dene communities in the north, fences are not a concept. There's no fences. Now, maybe you could argue, what's the use? Skidoos would just plow them over, and, you know, once they're under three feet of snow. Where I started to see fences was in the Athabasca region in the northern part of Saskatchewan. And, you know, I, I don't want to jump to conclusions. They were beautiful fences made of small um, pine logs. They were gorgeous fences. But it, it just really fascinated me why there were no fence, fences. Now, there's no reserves in the Northwest Territory. So, you know, it's not a, it's not a, a reserve issue. Um, I think it was an issue and a concept that had to do with there was so much space and the communities were so small when they were in community, community was just community. And uh, their uh, experience of fences was not there, you know? So um, anyway, just a reflection on that. Um, again, synodality is always reflected in everything, especially the ordinary everyday and the mundane. Not found in structures as much, maybe, because structures 
kind of help us, you know, live co-responsibility and help facilitate sharing and listening. But structures are not the central focus. The people of God are the central focus. Um, thus, synodality is a rich theological term expressing a co-responsibility. So let's move on about what this means and doesn't mean, especially given people can jump to conclusions that people have had many different political, social, maybe business experiences where, okay, co-responsibility, is that like a democracy or is it, you know, it's an alternative to a dicta dictatorship or, uh, you know, how do we, how do we, deal with difficult issues? What's the role of the pastor? Is he one voice amongst others? How about other voices in the parish? Do they merely listen and carry out what others or the pastor calls us to do? Or do they have a key role in, in sharing in responsible leadership? Okay. Synodality does not mean the following, that church leaders lose their ability and responsibility to provide pastoral care. Church is more of an inverted pyramid, you know, and again, you know, the, the greater one's response, pardon me, the greater one's authority, the greater their responsibility to serve the people of God. If you wanted to go to the great blueprint of this in the Old Testament, it's the story of the kings. You know, the kings of Israel or of, of the Hebrew people were in stark contrast with the kings of the far ancient Near East. I mean, their kings, uh, you know, as we hear the stories, well, rather than being um, the most powerful of men, they were the worst of men. And they kind of did what they wanted. Now, some of the kings of Israel were a bit similar. But the king of Israel was to imitate the heart of God. He was to have a preferential option for the stranger, the widow, the poor, the disenfranchised. Um, he was to be an ultimate servant, servant king, um, because he was to imitate the way of God, who is always saving his people. So it, that sort of inverted pyramid structure, the king's responsibility and power related to it was great, but he had to use it and direct it wisely and realize it was not his to do as he pleased. It was his responsibility entrusted to him for something much greater than himself. Synodality does not mean that the conclusions of structures must always be deliberative or consent giving. You know, and we're going to talk about consultation as a key feature of synodality. And synodality does not mean we have to have new structures, but these must be established before we can experience synodality. So a couple of reflections on what it doesn't mean. How about what it means? It means that all members of the church acknowledge the gifts of the Holy Spirit and share them generously. Everybody is gifted and called by the Holy Spirit. Um, it's, it's just impossible to be a member of the body of Christ to not be blessed, anointed by the Holy Spirit. Of course, we may respond to that anointing in lesser or greater ways. Um, but hopefully, through that anointing, through that blessing, we can't help but share the charisms that God gives us. We can't keep a charism. It dies. It must be shared. Synodality does mean that church leaders would serve more effectively, having learned more clearly the needs of their communities especially through careful listening, listening, listening. That there would, be in, in, there would be enhanced honest speaking and mutual listening amongst the members of the, of the people of God. And then a big theme for all the popes, but we're hearing it a lot from Pope Francis, an end to clericalism. And clericalism, I don't know if you've heard that term, clericalism is maybe a a gross heightening of, of the way and the influence and the, the status of clergy. And the problem with clericalism, clergy have their important role. I mean, uh, uh, this isn't about the decrease of clergy in terms of their real contribution. Uh, it's about the fullness of the office of priesthood and the fullness 
of the giftedness of the laity. And we need all of that to come to bear for the church to fire in all eight cylinders, if I could use that metaphor. So clericalism isn't just an issue for clergy, it can be an issue for laity. And lots of reflections on that problem. I mean, I, I, confirmations is a great occasion for me to get at this point. I'll look at out of these young kids and I'll look at them and they're looking at me like, what is this about? And we're excited, but we're not quite sure what it means. And they hear all this great language and I'll say to them, you know, look, you know, you're now called not just to be a, a, a receiver of the blessings of the church, which is important that you get in your younger years of formation. You are now called to share in the discipleship of Jesus and you will touch people. I, as a bishop, will never touch. And they'll look at me like, oh, no way. You're a bishop. You know everybody else. No. You, know what? you will touch people, young people, your friends, people as you grow in your schools and your work and your life. I will never touch. And um, yeah, there's maybe some people I'll touch that you won't. But we got to do this together. The, the, the mission requires this. Um, the feature of mission is all the people of God um, walking a synodal journey carrying out the mission of the Lord. So synodality is the work of God in the Holy Spirit. Synodality is an essential element of the church. Ain't a fad. <laughs> it's always been there. Um, it reflects a profound theological reality. Uh, it requires attentive listening always. I shared a story about listening in the homily yesterday. I might come back to it um, again. And then it involves bold, speaking, there's a time to speak, always respectful. It involves, a synodality is universally found in common, routine interactions. Synodality recognizes the giftedness of the Holy Spirit amongst all the people of God. Synodality is expressed in organs of communion at all levels of the church. Synodality faces temptations, a few of them. Listening is important, but silence, you know, not doing anything, a silence of indifference or fear or a sense of inadequacy. I'm just, I've never studied anything and I'm just an ordinary guy. Say that to the disciples in the early church. Inadequacy, timidity, and then again, synodality's greatest enemy is clericalism. Uh, we've talked about that. Some of you might recognize this guy, former Archbishop of Vancouver. When I was a younger priest, again, not long ago, um, he came to the Diocese of Vancouver, Archdiocese of Vancouver, and the first words he said to the priests, of all the things a new bishop could say, he wanted to talk about authority. We were kind of, oh, okay, well, this is interesting, you know. And he said the following, authority is an important reality in the church, and you as priests must exercise it and express it well but it must always be linked to responsible service, service of the body of Christ, not power. Anytime in human history, the shortcut is made from authority to power. We have always seen throughout human history, whether it's in uh, politics or business or in the church, great problems and transgressions. I never forgot that lesson. His first message to the clergy. Um, some of you, well, most of you don't know this, but um, I did a doctor of ministry in uh, 2004 to 2007 at an evangelical Protestant university called Trinity Western. Some of you have heard of it. And, um, and it was interesting at that place, uh, I, when I, I did that uh, degree, um, I was exposed to many other theologians in addition to Catholic theologians. And one of them was Dietrich Bonhoeffer, I don't know if you know his story, but he was martyred at the end of World War II by, by the Nazis. He was, he was hung. Um, he was a very dedicated, a committed, and strong uh, Christian prophet. And, uh, and for that, he became an increasing threat to the Nazi regime, and that, for that he was martyred. But he, he has a, a couple of quotes I'm going to make on him. I've been very taken with with him, um, as well as many other theologians that I'll touch on briefly. He says Christian service 
is the foundation of authority of the pastor and spiritual leader. He says, not individual ability or self-mastery. So if you want to be an excellent pastor, don't try to be a very capable um, man of your own making. Um, you need to be um, a man who serves, especially imitating the one who serves ultimately to the point of death, death on the cross. So um, let's move to a couple of other quotes that kind of reinforce what we're saying here. One is, this is from Pope Francis, and uh, this was, um, as he was leading up to the Synod, he had a, a, an opening statement um, of the Synod of Bishops on Young People back in October of 2018. And interesting, uh, this is what he says about this synod. The purpose of this synod and of this consultation is not to produce documents, but to plant dreams, draw forth prophecies and visions, allow hope to flourish, inspire trust, bind up wounds, weave together relationships, awaken the dawn of hope, learn from one another, and create a bright resourcefulness that will enlighten minds, warm hearts, give strength to our hands. Holy noodle. Pope Francis, do you really believe this? I, I, I'm kind of joking and not joking. Um, you can imagine there's many in the church who have been through many synods. Synods produce lots of documents, eh? And they produce manuals that can be referred to for implementation over many years and decades. So he's already laying the groundwork. I don't want that kind of synod. I want this kind of vision. So many are scratching their heads, especially, you know, the, 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 the clerics of the church who kind of done this and they do it well to try to come to terms with, okay, well, is this really a synod then? You know, is it, Kind of just a reflection. Uh, is it just an exercise in sharing several conversations in dioceses across the world? Well, we shall see. I want to touch on again the first theme, communion. And here's the definition or description of communion in the Vatimacum document I referred to earlier. By his gracious will, God gathers us together as diverse peoples of one faith through the covenant that he offers to his people. The communion we share finds its deepest roots in the love and unity of the Trinity. It is Christ who reconciles us to the Father and unites us with each other in the Holy Spirit. Together, we are inspired by listening to the word of God through the living tradition of the church and grounded in the sense of fidei, um, the, the, the sense of faith, that we share. We all have a role to play in discerning and living out God's call for his people. So this is the, the description of communion and it's kind of all encompassing, isn't it? But one of the themes that comes out is, you know, the model for communion is the Trinity, is the Godhead. Well, how do you come to terms with that? I mean, but God is not, God is one, but he is three persons. God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And isn't it fascinating to read the Gospels? Just read one Gospel. I like Mark because it's my namesake, and it's the shortest Gospel as well. And uh, you read about Christ's journey that's mentioned in the Gospel. There is this amazing, mysterious, wonderful relationship between him and the Father. And it unfolds in a mysterious way. And we don't hear all about it. We can't hear about all of it. But we get a strong sense that there is a reason why he spends many hours alone in prayer to his father, usually at night or in early morning. You know, and then at the end of his ministry, as he starts to talk about um, God's presence alive and well that will come after he suffered, dies, rises and ascends. The Holy Spirit will come and will teach you all you need to know. And then we know by our faith that that Holy Spirit um, proceeds from the Father and the Son, and who with the Father and the Son is glorified. You know, So um, the model of community is in God, 
God's self. So, um, you know, when we're feeling kind of isolated and alone, you know, our sense of aloneness, if it compels us into the heart of God, that can be a profound insight into deepening communion and community. Um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer had a few other reflections on community. Christianity, he said, could never be merely intellectual theory, doctrine to force from life, just mystical emotion. It must, it, it, but always it must be responsible, obedient action, the discipleship of Christ in every situation of concrete everyday life, personal and public. The Christian's pilgrimage, pilgrim journey is a privilege. To live in Christian fellowship is a privilege, as all Christians anticipate life everlasting with Christ. Visible fellowship is a special blessing, not something we should take for granted. Um, a couple of quick points um, on Bonhoeffer as well. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I'm going to skip that. He warns about an obstacle, which he calls the wish dream. And the wish dream he describes as the visionary dreaming that becomes a threat to genuine community. He states every human wish dream that is injected into the Christian community can be a hindrance to genuine community and must be banished if genuine community is to survive. For Bonhoeffer, um, the wish dream is um, the imposition of our own limited attitude about what community should be without attentively listening to the scriptures and meditating on the life of Christ. A couple of examples of the wish dream for, in my experience, you know, I'm a doer. If you have any insight into me whatsoever, I kind of a man of action. As a young guy, I was fire ready aim. I had to learn to get the order right. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, uh, um, Bishop Gary's a man of vision, by the way, and I've got lots of stories. I, I've known him for many years, and we, we shared pastoral ministry together for many years. Um, but the problem with being a fire ready aim guy is you want to get to the programs, you want to get to the strategy before you really discern God's plan. So sometimes a wish dream, and this is an issue for Pope Francis, is imposing structures in a program before really discerning the Holy Spirit's action and will for this people, this place, this time. There's many other examples, but that's a real one for me. Okay. Um, people, many of you have heard of Henry now. He, he's a priest who's died. And he talked about Christian community as a waiting community. He said, we're a culture in the West that doesn't wait well. We're very impatient with waiting. We are together, but we cannot fulfill each other. We help each other, but we also have to remind each other that our destiny is beyond merely our togetherness. <laughs> you know, uh, one of the worst things to do to create community is to say to, to the people of the parish, we're going to create community. It ain't going to work, I'll tell you right now. Uh, to bring people into a circle just to experience community you might look at each other and, you know, uh, what do we do? Nothing creates community better than being a part of the mission. You know, whether the mission is uh, a service project or accomplishing a task for elders or youth or, or maybe going out and working with others on a project or nothing also accomplishes community like coming together in worship and celebrating in prayer as a community and then being sent out, you know, uh, so uh, community is something that is a fruit of really participating in the mission of the Lord. I'm going to skip this part. Now, Pope Francis has a very specific uh, 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 teaching on the parish, and it came out in his apostolic exhortation, Evangelii Gaudium, uh, a few years ago. And um, hear this, you know, I... I you know, I have parishes in Saskatoon. I have 90 parishes. It's a lot of parishes. The reason why there's so many parishes is historically, as you know, in Saskatchewan, there were all sorts of parishes built in rural areas. And a lot of them have become small. And now some of those parishes have 10 families or 12 families. 
But those families hold on to that parish with, with, with great, great vehemence. And so um, uh, sometimes they lose their hope a bit because they wonder what can they do and what is their future. And so I've quoted to some of them this quote, the parish is not an outdated institution precisely because it possesses great flexibility. It can assume different contours depending on the openness and missionary creativity of the pastor and the community. While certainly not the only institution that evangelizes, if the parish proves capable of self-renewal and constant adaptivity, key phrase, it continues to be the church living in the midst of the homes of her sons and daughters. This presumes that it really is in contact with the home and the lives of its people and get ready, and does not become a useless structure out of touch with people or a self-absorbed group made up of a chosen few. <laughs> Pope Francis doesn't mince words, right? The parish is the presence of the church in a given geographical territory, an environment for hearing God's word, for growth in the Christian life, for dialogue, proclamation, charitable outreach, worship and celebration. There you've got six components that could make up sort of categories of a pastoral plan as a side note. In all its activities, the parish encourages and trains its members to be evangelizers. It's interesting this morning we, when we had the session, you know, the term we talked about, some of the people talked about the term evangelizers and evangelization. For some of them, it kind of had a bit of a negative connotation because it was associated with maybe, uh, not to get down on these things, but American televangelists, or it had a very narrow context. And yet, in Pope Paul VI document on evangelization, uh, Evangeli Nutiandi, the most important thing the church does is proclaim a kingdom, to proclaim Christ. By all, um, by comparison, everything else is in addition, is the rest. It's right in the document. Now, understand carefully, the source and summit of the Christian life is the celebration of the Eucharist. Those are not contradictory. You know, I mean, the source and summit that brings the church together in her, um, in her uh, journey, in her life of evangelization, is the celebration of the sacraments, especially the Eucharist. So it's fascinating how we have different sort of emphasis in our church that get at this one great task of mission. Um, oh, I didn't finish the quote. Okay, back to Pope Francis's quote on the parish. It is a community of communities, a sanctuary where the thirsty come to drink in the midst of their journey and a center of constant missionary outreach. We must admit though, that the call to review and renew our parishes has not yet sufficed to bring them near to people, to make them environments of living communion and participation, and to make them completely mission oriented. I have two visions for you, a bunker or a fountain. So as you think about a parish, what should it be? Well, what does a bunker do? A bunker is kind of like a, it's a, a strong defense, uh, has a great shell that protects people who are in it from the onslaught of the outside. Now, you know what? A bunker has its place. <laughs> I, I was in Israel as a younger man, and I worked on the kibbutz. This is before I entered seminary. And it was in the northeast finger of Israel. It's called Mayan Baruch. We were right on the Lebanese border. And right to our northeast was the Golan Heights. Well, you know what happened in the Golan Heights for a while. Um, bombs were kind of hurled down from the Golan Heights by uh, you know, the Syrians. And the people in those communities were getting bombed. And so they had to build bunkers. Now, I love the bunker because it was two feet thick of concrete in the walls and three to four feet thick on the ceiling. And in the hot summer, it was nice and cool and comfortable. I felt pretty protected in the bunker. Well, that was the bunker. Well, then a few months later, I went to Europe, my first trip to Europe. 
And I, I, I really wanted to visit the small off the beaten track communities. And I noticed in many of these small little towns, they'd have this village fountain. And the fountain was sort of near the center of town or in the center of town. And people would hang out and children would play in it and elders would sit on benches just back and parents would interact. And uh, it was a place where people really came together, enjoyed the life from the fountain. So later on, these two images really stayed with me as I thought about what is the image for the church in the world? What is the image of the local parish community? And there's one scripture that really biases one to the other. And I don't mean to, to demonize the bunker. You know, There's a place for the bunker. But I think the real vision is more like the fountain. Read Ezekiel 47 of the temple. Water was flowing from the threshold of the temple. Um, then I was brought out to the way of the north gate. Uh, mortal, have you seen this? As the water came out from the sides, he led me back to the river. And I saw the bank of the river where the water produced great many trees on the one side and the other. These waters flow to all regions. And whenever the river goes, living creatures that swarm will live and there will be many fish. And once these waters reach there, it will become fresh. Everything will live where the river goes. Of course, in the heart of the temple is the Holy of Holies. Of course, that's the Old Testament. In the heart of the temple is the real presence of the Lord. You know? So anyway, fascinating uh, image that inspires what we mean by the parish. One of the tasks, it could be the task for your parish as you move into synod over the next few months, would be to, um, um, I, I won't get into the logistics, Father Dean and the diocese would do that, but for each parish to probably gather a coordinator or a coordinating team to carry out a reading of the Vatimekum, or at least key phrases of it, and then to have a discussion in various groups. And the discussion would be reflecting on the, on the 10 questions that are given to us in the Vata Makam to share and reflect on. Now, I thought I'd just name the 10 themes of the questions. The first one is companions on the journey. The second one is all about listening. Uh, the third one is about how we speak out. The, the fourth one is about celebration. The fifth one is about co-responsibility and the mission. The sixth one is about the place of dialogue in the church and society. Isn't this prophetic? And we're in a tough time in the world where dialogue is so polarized, whether it's the pandemic or whether it's uh, uh, different cultural issues or, or different political issues that not only can people not dialogue, they won't even listen. So I'm wondering if this synod on synodality comes to us at maybe a more important time than ever. Ecumenism is another uh, uh, theme. Authority and participation. I spent a fair bit of time on authority. The ninth theme, discerning and deciding. And then the tenth one, forming ourselves in synodality. My committee met at my diocese and uh, they said, well, you know what? For many parishes, 10 different sets of questions is too much. So we will suggest five or six. If a parish wants to do all 10, go, go for it. And we got that idea from a couple of other dioceses that kind of discern the same thing. So we, we've suggested one, two, three, five, six, and nine. But of course, we're making available everything. And if parishes want to do more or less, that's up, that's up to them. You know, some parishes, they could break into groups and they could really drill down on just a couple of questions and that would be fruitful. But as I mentioned these questions, Okay, here's an example. So this is one of the questions number two on listening. Well, there's eight sub questions, right? You know, so there's not just 10 topics, there's 10 categories and each of them has their, their own set of questions. So that's why it's not a bad idea to pick and choose. Um, I think that sort of sums up. Um, so where I'd like to go 
in the coming days is I want to move to a place where I do cover communion, participation, and mission. But I will tomorrow, and then the last day in particular, allude to a, send us some ideas for a pastoral plan. Remember in the quote from Pope Francis, I mentioned six components. That's not rocket science. Those six components come from Acts chapter two, the early Christian community in the Acts of the Apostles. So if you wanted simple categories to help you as a parish focus on, or where are we at right now with you know, our teaching the faith, with how we worship together, um, with our service, you know, with uh, teaching the faith, you know, you, um, th those categories, everybody looks at those, they uses those categories. Uh, you may have others you, you wish to look at. So I'll refer to those as well. I conclude just by pointing out that you may be wondering where is all this going? Well, there's three phases. Phase one is the consultation with the people of God and Really, I mean, we started in the fall with the early celebration with Pope Francis, but most dioceses, including ours and I think yours, well, we're starting really practically about now, and early in the new year from January to April, we'll kind of get into this parish process of, of, uh, of uh, gathering and posing these questions and having a sharing and then getting the feedback and then sending it to the diocese. Well, then the diocese sends it to the Conference of Catholic Bishops of Canada. Well, then there's phase two, a continental phase. Now, the continental phase is just that. And here in North America, we have a, two countries. We have the U.S. and Canada. And I remember one of my brother bishops saying, the U.S. church is so different from Canada. Why don't they just do their thing and we do ours? And Pope Francis, well, apparently the, the, the congregation of the Vatican said, no. I mean... Because we have, challenge, we have challenges locally about trying to come together, we also have challenges on a global level of coming together. So there's a real desire that there is a consultation and sharing on a continental level. And then following that, then phase three, which really involves the assembly in, in Rome. And, um, and, and that will take us to uh, you know, mid to later in 2023. And it'll be interesting to hear those conclusions. Now in our diocese, we're gonna take back the consultation and have that invigorate our own diocesan pastoral plan, which we did a year and a half ago. So um, I'm, I, I'm looking forward to the phase three, but already our diocese is gonna use this as a, a teachable moment and an opportunity to renew our parishes and our diocese. Also wanna point out in Canada, you know what? Truth and reconciliation is upon us. And our, looking at our relationship with our Indigenous, non-Indigenous brothers and sisters is a huge priority. I, I just was really inspired last night in uh, Lanigan, uh, in, uh, in your, your, uh, the other parish in Langford, to uh, meet the, a house of people who joined uh, the parish community at Langford for a wonderful evening. And um, those kinds of things need to happen as, uh, you know what? Nothing breaks ground like sharing food and sharing stories and being welcomed together in a warm, common space. And that was wonderful. Um, but I mention this because I think the synod on synodality must also address the, the whole issue of truth, reconciliation, and healing, which isn't just an Indigenous issue, by the way. Healing is a big feature for all our parishes. Uh, never forget what Cardinal Henry Newman said to change, to live is to change, and to have lived well is to change often. I quoted that yesterday, I think. And for Newman, he's a good theologian. He's not talking about change for change's sake. He's talking about ongoing growth and conversion, which is right in the Catholic Catechism. You and I go through two conversions, first at baptism, and then the second, the phrase is the ongoing conversion of life and heart. Every day we're called to growth and deepening and healing. And that was a big theme I heard from the, the Denny and Inuit people when I went north. So I, how might this perspective also influence your sharing in your questions and discussion? So lots of themes and concepts, but let us experience the joy 
of encountering God who takes us to the margins. And we're not merely speaking about geographical margins, but existential margins, which affect our young people, our elders, affect us right here where we live. Looking forward to this adventure together. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Bishop Mark, for a really substantial first uh, talk. I'll bet you uh, there's some questions, comments, um, and what we'd like to offer now is uh, a, a beautiful social. I don't know what the aroma is. But, it's but pretty it's, distracting. It's, it's, it's beautiful. <laughs> yeah. Whatever it is, I think it might be the mold wine, but it smells so good. Uh, so you're invited to uh, come to the back. We'll, we'll, if you're going to restaurants these days, we'll try and practice what they're doing, which is mask while we're uh, communally interacting and going around the table. And then once you're seated uh, and you can drink your mold wine and eat your uh, refreshments, obviously take your mask off as comfortable as you're seated uh, and, and stationary. Uh, keep in mind, uh, tomorrow we're back here at 9 o'clock for, for more. Um, same kind of thing with the, uh, with, with the opportunity for confession afterwards. Uh, with me and Bishop Mark and uh, two other priests, I pray and hope they show up. Uh, and during this time of social, I'll just uh, intervene a little bit once we've had some informal chit chat and uh, attempt to facilitate a little bit of Q and A with Bishop Mark. Not that he's going to teach or, or or lecture more, uh, but actually he he's suggested it'd be a good thing for him to to listen to you. Uh, I think it would be a good thing for me to listen to you too. Uh, so that's the plan. Does that sound good? So enjoy. Get up uh, and go to the back. And I don't know how Kevin's going to run this, but wonderful job. Kevin uh, Stevens is in the kitchen right now. He's done a fabulous job of setting this up. Thank you. Thank you.